Hi, my name is Adina, and in this OHBM Brain Hack Train Track session, I'm going to be talking about DataLed. DataLed is a data management and data publication multi tool, and I will be spending the next one and a half hours showing you how it can be used to version control your next project in all aspects, or how it can assist you in the reproducibility of your results. Should you be wondering where I am, I'm in a rabbit hutch. <laughs> Should you ask yourself, why the hell is she in a rabbit hutch? Then I would say, well, why not? Um, given that the pandemic limits where we can currently go and the company that we can currently have, um, I chose to be in the most exciting place with the most corona conform company I have access to. And this is why I'm joined today by the two cute bunnies, Emil and Nala. You can see uh, Emil munching a carrot right next to me. This has the great advantage that you have the chance of uh, cute bunny content uh, in addition to amazing data light content. <laughs> Don't worry, um, I'm not enforcing a software demonstration on two innocent bunnies. That would be really cruel. Um, the door of this incredibly large enclosure is open and the two can leave whenever they want. As can you, by the way. So if you want to leave this train track or mute me, go ahead. I won't even notice. It's a win-win situation. So from the middle of Germany, in some rabbit hutch, a very friendly hello to you wherever you may be in the world. I hope that you stay safe during this pandemic and that you've made yourself comfortable and brought a computer with you to this train track session. So let's get started with DataLed. There are many different use cases for DataLed. One straightforward reason that I use it personally for is to version control all of my um, personal projects, whether that are data analyses, um, writing a book such as the Data Lead Handbook, version controlling my CV, creating uh, presentations and videos uh, like this one, um, or managing my music library. I call this uh, straightforward because one thing that Data Lead does is version control. Um, version control means tracking changes made to files over time and having the ability to revert changes or view specific states of a file or of a project's history. Unlike version control with tools like Git, DataLed can not only manage small files such as um, code or uh, other text, but files of any size. This makes it possible to version control 500 gigabytes of neuroimaging data with DataLed, for example, or manage my complete music library. But I have more use cases for DataLed, and so will you. Um, I, again, use it to create uh, provenance tracked and computationally reproducible scientific analyses. So when I write a paper, then I use DataLed to link data, code, software, and the results, and then I publish all of that to Git repository hosting services such as GitHub to make my work uh, openly and easily accessible to others. And in my home institution, the Jülich Research Center, we use DataLed for really large-scale, fair data analysis projects on supercomputing infrastructure. Other common use cases, uh, for example, concern data publication or collaborative work on analyses. And you may have even other use cases for data. It's an incredibly versatile tool. Um, with my demonstration today, I hope that I can give you an idea of what's generally possible and a good starting point to get going with DataLed. I won't go into all of the details and I won't be able to mention everything that is possible with DataLed. But if my demonstration interested you, then there are resources out there that will get you started with however you want to use DataLed. First and foremost, those resources are collected in what is called the DataLed Handbook. You can find it as an HTML version um, in a PDF or EPUB format at handbook.datalet.org. This handbook is a hands-on crash course on DataLed that you can turn to to learn how to use DataLed. It's written in a community effort and it teaches you everything you need to know regardless of the background that you have.
Beyond the course like tutorial, the handbook also contains advanced topics such as um, a chapter on scaling up. So if you're interested in version controlling um, projects that are as large as the human connectome project or larger, uh, or run analysis on them, go ahead and read this chapter. And it also contains use cases. Those are step-by-step -step instructions um, and overviews on the different use cases uh, that DataLed assists with. Those can be basic, like um, a general introduction uh, to provenance tracking with DataLed, but they can also be quite comprehensive. For example, how to write a completely reproducible paper, um, or how to implement a central data management and data archival solution on an infrastructural level for a scientific institute. If you want to find out more, visit the handbook at handbook.datalet.org or come to poster 1914 uh, later at the OHBN. So let's start with the boring stuff. Datalet is a command line tool and it has a Python API. So whenever I use it, I either operate it in a terminal using um, a command that starts with datalet. Um, or I use it in scripts, such as shell scripts, Python scripts, Jupyter notebooks, and so forth. In the command line, um, this is how it looks like. I always start with a general datalet command, and then I add whatever subcommand I need. And um, if I use it in its Python API, then this is the line that I would use to import datalet. And you will later see a script um, where I show you how this is done. Cool. Uh, Datalet builds up on two version control tools, namely Git and Git Annex. They both provide the version control features that Datalet offers. Git Annex takes care of handling large file content that Git wouldn't be able to manage. In order to use Datalet, you will need to have all three tools installed, so Git, Git Annex and Datalet. However, you don't need to know how to use Git or Git Annex. It's completely fine if you have never used Git before. Datalet tries to hide the complexities of the other tools as best as it possibly can. You can find details on how to install Datalet and its dependencies on all operating systems um, or uh, using several package managers in the Datalet handbook. It also details how to install Datalet on shared machines such as um, high performance compute clusters where you don't have administrative um, privileges uh, so pseudo writes. Um, once you have uh, Datalet installed, we can go right into this train track. If you have Datalet already installed, but you're not sure uh, whether it is an old version of Datalet, please go and check it now. Um, it is important for this train track session that you have a quite recent version of Datalet, at least version 0 0.12 or higher. You can do this by typing datalet dash dash version into your terminal. Um, if you have an outdated version of datalet, then the handbook the, uh, will also uh, show you how to uh, upgrade uh, to the most recent datalet version. All of that can be found in the section installation and configuration that uh, is shown in the slides. Cool. Right after the installation of Datalet, the very first thing that we have to do, um, if you haven't done so yet, is to configure your Git identity. Um, if you've never used Git, again, don't worry. The identity that we are providing here with the git config command um, consists only of your name and email address, and it will be used to associate a change that you make in any of the version control features of Datalet with you as an author. So that's a useful feature to have. And if you don't do the configuration, then Datalet will um, warn you constantly. Now that you have configured your Git identity, um, we're ready to use Datalet for the next project. So let's dive into the basic concepts and commands so that you can get an idea of um, how it can be used and what it can be used for. If you have it installed right now, then I invite you during this train track to follow along with me and use the same commands that I'm using. You can find them to copy and paste into your terminal at handbook.datalet.org. In this demonstration, I'm using content from the basics part of the handbook. 
This part is a quote-along crash course and it follows a narrative that takes readers through a fictional educational course called Data-Led 101. Um, so for the rest of this demonstration, envision yourself as a student in this college course um, and the examples that I'm using here are thus not really related to neuroscience um, but uh, tuned to this college course narrative. Uh, but it will not be difficult for you to link your own use cases to the data-led concepts and commands I will be showing you, because data-led is a completely domain agnostic tool. So, the foundation or the most basic concepts that we have to start with is um, the data set. Everything that we will use data-led for happens in so-called data-led data sets. A data set is the core data structure of data-led. But honestly, it's nothing fancy. A dataset is just a directory on your computer that you instruct Datalet to manage. And absolutely any directory on your computer can be managed by Datalet. You can create datasets um, as empty directories and then populate them. You can transform existing uh, directories that already have content into datasets uh, to version control their contents. Or you can install datasets from elsewhere to obtain the data that they contain. Um, and even though it's not the coolest feature, or it doesn't sound like the coolest feature right now, datasets can be nested in each other. So you can create a hierarchy of datasets. And I will show you later uh, how this feature is quite amazing. In the narrative of the uh, handbook's basic part, we are students. And in the first lesson, in chapter one, um, we are creating a data-led dataset to collect all the course materials of the data-led 101 course into. Um, we will follow this narrative to experience some of the basics of data-led datasets, because it's much easier to just explore the stuff instead of um, boringly have it explained to you. Um, creating a dataset is done with the data-led create command. This command only needs a name um, and it will subsequently create a new directory under this name and instruct Datalet to manage it. Here, this command also has an additional option, the dash "-c text to git option. With the dash "-c option, uh, datasets can be configured in a certain way at the time of creation. You can find out about the details of the text to git configuration in the Datalet handbook, but in general, this configuration is a very useful standard configuration for datasets. You can see uh, when I execute this uh, command that Datalet informs what it is doing during the execution. At the end of this command, as um, with any command that Datalet performs, uh, it will print a summary. In this case, it is a successful create operation as indicated by this um, OK in brackets. Um, and right after dataset creation, there is now a new directory on your computer called Datalet 101. If we now navigate into this directory with the change directory command, this is this cd command, and then list the contents of this data set with the ls command, uh, then we'll see that it's empty. That's not surprising because we haven't put anything inside of it yet. However, there are some hidden directories at work, um, and those hidden directories are the version control tools that uh, Datalet builds up on. And thanks to these version control tools, this dataset has really cool features. For example, uh, a dataset can record everything that is done inside of it. It can version control all content given to it, regardless of how large this content is. And it can have a complete history that you can interact with, check out previous dates, revert, and so forth. Um, even though the dataset is empty and doesn't version control anything yet, this history is already present uh, and we'll check it out to just get, get you uh, an idea of how it looks like and uh, get some core concepts uh, known to you. Um, in general, this history exists thanks to the version control tool Git. Uh, therefore, you can access the history with any tool that shows you Git history. Um, here we say basic and um, simply use the built-in git tool git lock or git command uh, git lock. Um, but if you have other tools that you find visually more pleasing, then go ahead and use them. You can uh, visualize uh, the history with whatever tool you want. When running git lock, um, it will show you the history of the dataset as git commits. 
these um, git commits are shown in a certain sequence, the most recent commit is always at the top. The commits are created every time that you save a change and they have particular information in them. Uh, one important piece is this 40 uh, character string. This is a so-called commit hash or sha sum or check sum and it's a string that can uniquely identify any given commit in your dataset. Um, you can also see that each commit has an author and a date and a time of the change recorded and what you can uh, finally see is that there's a short message attached to each commit. Um, we refer to this message as a commit message and uh, in general it's a short and informative um, summary of what was done in a particular change. Uh, usually you will need to provide such commit messages and they are useful for you and others to um, easily know what was done in human readable in a human readable way. Um, the two commits that are currently in your dataset uh, have commit messages that were created by Datalet though because those two commits are associated with the creation and the configuration of the dataset. The reason that this history is accessible with um, Git uh, tools is that a dataset is a Git repository. It just has some more features than a Git repository and you will get to know them soon. Um, if you are a Git user, therefore, you can use any Git command of your choice in this dataset and it will um, just work out of the box. Um, if you're not a Git user, you can still use any Git command, but you can also use all of the datalet commands that I'm going to show you. Now, because this dataset is really quite boring still, let's put some contents inside and version control them. This first part of the demonstration uh, will show you the general local version control workflows that you can do with datalet on any type of data. Um, because uh, this narrative contains um, an educational class, let's put a few books, um, such as the readings that you would usually get in a college class inside of the dataset. For this, I'm downloading a couple of books and put them uh, into my dataset. Um, I'll start to be neat and orderly by creating a books directory with the mkdir command, um, just to have a place for those books to live in. And afterwards, I will download two books from the internet. Here, I'm doing this with the command line tool wget. Um, it's just convenient for me to do all of this in the command line, even though the command is a bit lengthy and intimidating. It's just a download. Um, if you want to, you can, of course, just go to the web page that these books are hosted on, click on the download button and save them in this directory. After all, um, your dataset just looks like any regular directory on your computer and you can just save a PDF in whatever way you would usually save a PDF into this. Um, the books that I'm downloading here are free and open source. Um, in general, I can recommend them. They are on the Linux command line and on Python programming. And uh, now that I've downloaded them, I can see how my directory structure looks like by running the tree command that shows me the file hierarchy uh, in my um, directory or in my dataset. Um, here I can see that there are the two books that I've downloaded as PDFs in the books directory. The question is, how does the version control software that is now working in this directory um, behave now that there is content inside? Um, for this, I'm simply going to ask the dataset what its current state is. And um, for this, I'm going to use the data let status command. Uh, the data let status command is a very helpful command that you should use very often. It reports on the current state of your dataset. Any content that is new or changed will be highlighted. And if nothing has changed, the data let status report will um, report on something that is called a clean dataset state. And uh, just as a heads up, the clean dataset state is the thing that you should strive for in your work routines. Always make sure that you commit the changes that you have or save the changes that you have and have a clean dataset. All right. Now this output of datalite status shows you that the directory with the new PDF files is untracked. Uh, and this means that, is it, that it is yet unknown to any of the version control software. So as uh, a first take home message, uh, this shows you that you need to explicitly give any content 
uh, to Datalet to have it version controlled. It's not enough to simply add it to a dataset. How can we instruct Datalet to version control these contents? We save them with the Datalet save command. Um, this is the first time that we're using this command. And this is the first time that you need to specify a commit message yourself. So what we're doing is data let's save and then the dash M option uh, to which we can attach a concise summary of what we have downloaded, for example. In this case, I'm just describing the books that I've downloaded. Afterwards, um, save reports that it has added those books to the data set and data let now knows about the books directory and the two PDFs inside of it. Um, if I use git log dash N1, I can take a look at the most recent commit in my history um, and I add uh, the information, the way that this information is displayed here is again something that one needs to get used to if, if you're not used to seeing Git histories, but it's quite, you can get used to it quite fast. Um, in any case, thanks to the commit message, uh, we know exactly what has been done by whom and uh, also when. Now. <clears throat> this was already really easy just to save. Um, so you already know how to version control content with Datalet. Um, let's work on some best practices just because this was so easy. Um, you might have noticed that the Datalet save command that we just ran saved all of the untracked changes that were present in the dataset. And this is the default of Datalet save. Data let's save, if you don't specify anything else, uh, will uh, save all of the untracked modifications uh, or unsaved modifications in your data set. And that's behavior that's sometimes inconvenient. One great advantage of a data set's history is that it allows you to revert changes that you're not happy with. But um, this is only easily possible if the units are single uh, commits. So if one save commits several unrelated files or changes, uh, then those are hard to disentangle if you ever want to revert some of those changes. But um, if you uh, provide atomic changes that are one meaningful unit that can be um, reverted without affecting any other change in your dataset, then you're good to go. So how can you do this? One way is to specify precisely which files you want to add. And this can be done by simply appending a path to the data let save command. Uh, we can show you um, how this is done by simply downloading another book. Um, uh, first, again, we download it, then check um, the state of the data set with the data let status command, and uh, then we'll save it. So um, data let status shows that it's an untracked file as expected. And if I now want to demonstrate precisely how to specify this exact file to be saved, then it's a data let's save, an informative commit message, and a path to this new file. Awesome. Um, before we move on to the next demonstrations, let's take a look at files that are frequently modified, um, for example, code or text. Um, to try this or to, to show it to you, I will create a file and modify it. In the context of an educational course, I will create a um, file which collects notes on the educational course datalet 101. So I'm just creating a file where I frequently write notes about the datalet commands I'm learning into. The way I'm writing these notes is a bit convoluted because uh, I again want to do everything inside of the terminal. Uh, and this is why I'm using here docs. This is a form of Unix redirection to paste text into a file. Um, so the first note that I'm writing is just this middle um, of the of the um, line I'm executing. So it's one can create a new data set with data let create path. The data set is created empty. Um, and executing this line will write this to a new file uh, notes.txt. Uh, you can also just <clears throat> open up any editor of your choice and then just write the notes in any way that you would usually write notes or text. Now a data let status will, as expected, report this file as being untracked. Um, and we can again save it with a data let save command and a helpful commit message. Because um, this file is the only change that's present in the data set, I don't even need to provide a path. Let's now add another node to modify this um, file that is already version controlled. 
Again, I'm doing this here with a year doc. Um, the next data light status report uh, does not report this file to be untracked, but because it differs now from the state that it was saved under, um, it is reported to be modified. And how can I save a modified file? Again, with data let save. <laughs> if I take a look at the history of this file now, um, again with git log, then the history neatly summarizes all of the changes that we have done. This means that uh, taken together, local version control is really easy with data let. It requires a data set, and afterwards, all of the modifications that you do to this dataset can be saved regardless of the size or type using data let save. If you save only meaningful units of change and attach helpful commit messages, then it will be easy for you to create a dataset history that you and your future self and others can understand right away and that you can also interact with well. Cool. So to summarize everything that has happened so far in this train track, here's a short overview. Data Light Create creates an empty dataset. There are useful configuration options you've seen text to Git. Um, there will also be Yoda um, that apply suitable defaults to your datasets. Um, and you can read up on all of the details on them in the Data Light Handbook. Uh, dataset has a history, and this history um, is used to track files and the modifications done to them. You can explore it with any tool that is able to um, explore git log. My personal favorite, for example, is TIG, T -I -G, uh, that gives a really nice, beautiful, visually pleasing summary. Um, data let's say records the dataset or file state to the history of your dataset. And if you attach a concise commit message, then your future self and others will thank you for this human readable information that makes your dataset history understandable. Um, data let status is a command that you will frequently run because it is a command that reports on the state of a dataset. And um, just to uh, reiterate, a clean dataset status is good practice. So always try to have uh, all of your changes saved at one point. Cool. So just by using version control, you can already improve your work greatly. You will work more cleanly, you have less cluttered directories, and you also have the safe feeling that comes from the certainty that no changes that have, added, have been added at one point to your dataset can ever be lost. That's quite nice. All right, let's get to the next topic in this demonstration, consuming datasets. There are many awesome datasets out there that you can store on your computer. For example, we have public datasets with hundreds of gigabytes of openly shared neuroscientific data that you can use for your analysis. Um, all of the datasets on Open Neuro, for example, are available as data led datasets. And um, I can show you now how to install a data led dataset. Um, the uh, educational course does not download a dataset from Open Neuro, um, but here we are installing another public dataset that is a podcast series that is called the Long Now series, uh, the Long Now seminars. Sorry. Um, first, I again will create a subdirectory in my dataset for this to keep everything nice and orderly. Here, I'll call it Recordings. Afterwards, I install the dataset that I'm interested in. This can generally be a path or it can be a URL. And if you check out the data led handbook, then you can find many more sources that you can install datasets from. And in this case, um, the dataset lives on GitHub. So in order to get it, I will provide its URL to the data led clone command. Um, importantly, I'm uh, also attaching a path at the end of the data led clone command that points to the directory where I want to install this dataset in. That's the new directory I've just created. And also importantly, I'm installing this dataset as what is called a subdataset of DataLet 101. In other words, I will nest the two datasets, DataLet 101 and the uh, long now uh, dataset into each other. Then I have a super dataset and a subdataset. And this is done by providing a dash dash dataset flag and a path to the root, in this case it's just a dot, uh, to the top level dataset. 
here's how this um, sub data set looks like right after I cloned it. There are uh, new directories in my datalet101 data set. And if I navigate into these new directories and then list the contents of one of it, uh, then there are hundreds of mp3 files. And uh, given the amount of files that we're seeing here, it is really quite surprising how fast the installation of the dataset was. Um, I personally would expect that it should take much longer to download a directory with that many files. But here's the crucial and incredibly handy feature of data datasets. At this point, right after cloning, the dataset um, only contains small files, for example, the readme files. And what we simplify or uh, refer to as uh, file availability metadata. All of these mp3 files that you can see in here don't have any file content yet. Think of them as only being file names, uh, but not having content. So if I would um, try to play one of the recordings, then this would fail. Uh, here I'm trying to um, open it up with the VLC player and you can see that the poor tool complains that it just can't find the file that I want to open up. Um, this is uh, weird to get used to but incredibly handy. This makes this dataset really lightweight and fast to install but because I can still explore the hierarchy of the files in this dataset, I can check what is available. So let's take a look at the size of this directory. Um, I'm using the du command uh, to so show the disk usage. Um, and this data set right after installation is tiny because I've told you file content is not available yet, only small files. But I can also find out how large the data set would be if um, I would get all of the file contents. Um, and for this I can use data let status with the dash dash annex flag. So in total, uh, it appears that in this data set would be more than 15 gigabytes of mp3 files. And because I've installed this data set, I now have access to these files should I want to. Um, file retrieval, um, that means getting the file contents actually down to my computer, uh, is done with the datalet get command. This command can uh, retrieve individual or groups of files, directories, sub datasets, whatever you specify, um, and then download their contents. Um, I will do it for one podcast title, and you can see how it summarizes the operation in the end with a um, OK to indicate that successful retrieval happened. Afterwards, I can actually open up the file content and it is now locally available, so I can now listen to my podcasts. And if that would be an open neural data set, I can analyze the neural imaging data I have just downloaded. Um, if we retrieve more files, including one that was already retrieved, um, so I'm retrieving three files in total, but one of them already has the content locally available, then you can see that it is not re-retrieving the already existing content. It will summarize um, this file to be not needed and the other one's content is retrieved. Cool. Now, imagine that this data set wasn't about podcasts, but for example, the Human Connectome Project. Um, we make the HCP data available as a data set that you can install from GitHub, just as you have with this podcast repository. That makes it um, very easily accessible. Um, when you clone this uh, data set, then uh, in its entirety, with all of the sub data sets that the HCP data set that is on GitHub um, has, uh, it will have 15 million files and 80 terabytes of data. And that's a lot to store on a single computer. However, if you um, take into account the features that data-led datasets have right after cloning, uh, you realize that even though you have access to all of the 80 terabytes of HCP data, the dataset that you have downloaded will be incredibly tiny. And you can download only those files that you are currently needing because 
probably your analyses of the HCP data will not require 80 terabytes of files or all of the 15 million files, but maybe just a subset of them. Cool. So this is already a disk space saving approach to things. Um, by still having access to all of the data and um, only retrieving that data that you currently need, in theory, you can have more data on your computer than your hard drive has um, available disk space. That sounds cool, doesn't it? Um, and we can take this further um, because now imagine that um, you have run an analysis on the HCP data. So uh, in theory, only your results are what is important. You can always um, re-download the HCP data, but your results are unique and you should save them. Let's take a look at this in our uh, narrative. So let's say that you've listened to a podcast and that you don't need the content anymore. Um, then you can use um, the command data let drop to remove the content. Uh, in its place, after you've dropped the content, there will still be um, the file name, so to say, but um, no content, just as it was uh, right after you cloned this dataset. And because Datalet knows where to get the data from, uh, it can just be re-retrieved. So if I run Datalet get again, then I have downloaded it again. That's, that's quite handy. Note, though, that um, dropping and re-retrieving data does only work for data where Datalet knows the origin. So um, you can drop data from installed datasets, for example, and data that you have attached origin provenance um, to, but um, you shouldn't uh, attempt to drop data that um, you've just added to your dataset, um, because uh, this operation would permanently remove the content from the dataset and Datalet yet will not know where to retrieve those files from. So don't drop the PDFs that you have added to this dataset. Should you attempt to do this, Datalet will warn you though and not let you proceed without forcing. Cool. So at this point, you have the means to version control um, arbitrary large contents and you can consume existing datasets and you can save disk space by getting or dropping data on demand. One other aspect that is useful to understand is dataset nesting. Let's take a look into the history of this long now subdataset. We can see that it has preserved its history completely. There is no notion about PDFs or nodes that um, were created in the Datalet 101 dataset, um, but here we can see um, the complete evolution of this data set. I can find out who created it and what was done to it. This means that um, this data set has kept all of its provenance. How does um, the addition of the sub data set look like in the top level data set? Uh, if we query the data led 101 history, then there uh, also will be no um, of the commits that we have just seen, no commits about mp3 files um, or any of the other commits. And instead, we can see that the sub, uh, that the super dataset um, recorded the long now dataset as a sub dataset. This means that it recorded where this dataset came from. So here it is its GitHub URL and what version it is in. Um, do me a favor and memorize this. Um, commit sharsum that is referred to as subproject commit here for a short time. Uh, at least the start, the first few characters of it. Uh, I'll navigate into the sub dataset again, and here we notice that uh, the sharsum that we have memorized is the sharsum of the most recent commit in the sub dataset. So, what the super dataset recorded is the most recent version. And thus, by nesting datasets, you have a way of linking a dataset in a precise version to another dataset. Uh, let's quickly summarize everything we have seen on dataset consumption and nesting. Uh, you can install a dataset using datalet clone, either from a path or a URL, or if you read the handbook, uh, also from a range of other sources. In this example, we have seen a dataset being installed as a sub dataset inside of an existing dataset by specifying the dash dash dataset option. Um, and a path to the root of the top-level dataset 
But you can also install datasets on their own outside of existing datasets by just not using the dash dash dataset option. Right after the installation of a dataset, it is really lightweight. Um, there are only small files and um, metadata about file availability present. Um, and you can retrieve any data that is not yet uh, present using the data that get command whenever you need it. If data doesn't need to be present locally anymore, then you can uh, drop it using the data that drop command to save disk space. And finally, datasets preserve the history. Thus, I can find out things like what was done to a dataset, how did a file came to be, or who did work on this, uh, and much more. Uh, and when nesting datasets, the uh, top-level dataset or the super dataset uh, records the version that uh, the sub-dataset is in. But now, what makes this last point so special? It's sometimes a bit hard to grasp if you have these simplified examples. Um, in principle, it allows to join independent components for, uh, say, uh, a study. Um, let me give you a concrete example of this to make it a bit more clear. Um, for this, I'll briefly abandon the uh, handbook narrative and instead I'm showing you a paper that I have written. Thanks to Datalet, this paper is completely and automatically reproducible and I'm able to share code, uh, data, manuscript and code execution on GitHub. So if you want to, uh, check out the GitHub repository in this link uh, and try it out yourself or read all about the details on creating such a reproducible paper in a dedicated use case in the Datalet handbook. This repository is a dataset that I published to GitHub. The top-level dataset contains the LaTeX sources for the manuscript and the code that computes the results I report in my paper. The dataset also contains sub-datasets that contain the various data that this code is executed on. And I set everything up in a way that figures and results can be computed locally and are directly embedded into the manuscript after the computations have run. With such a repository, I can not only share my code and data, but everyone can simply recompute every result of my paper and validate its claims. And all of that openly available on GitHub. That's quite neat. So what happened while I wrote this paper was that data for my computations changed because the mistake was fixed. Um, with Datalet, though, I was able to simply update the data to its fixed state and record which version of the data my computations are based on. Let me show you this in a bit more detail. This way I can also show you how cloning nested datasets feels like. So uh, to, dive, to dive into this, I uh, clone this dataset from GitHub. Afterwards, I can check out um, the sub-datasets of the top-level dataset. Uh, I can do this with the command data let sub-datasets. This lists all of the available uh, sub-datasets of the current dataset. Um, one of the sub-datasets is called Remotna, um, and that's a dataset that contains the source code for a Python package called Remotna fused in eye tracking analysis that this paper is about. Now, um, after cloning a dataset, its sub-datasets will be known, but just as content is not yet retrieved for files in the datasets, uh, sub-datasets of datasets are not yet installed. So if I navigate into an uninstalled sub-dataset, it will appear like an empty directory. You can see that if I list the contents, there's nothing. In order to install a sub-dataset, um, I again use data let get. This command doesn't only retrieve file content, but uh, it also installs sub-datasets. So if you want to be really lazy, uh, you can just run uh, data let get dash dash recursive um, and then uh, dash n in the root of a dataset to install all of the available sub datasets down the hierarchy of datasets. The dash n option um, prevents data from being downloaded. It is short for dash dash no data. The recursive option um, recurses into the hierarchy of all of the datasets. Um, and here I'm limiting how deep I actually want to install datasets because this dataset is really quite nested. Um, okay. Afterwards, um, I can again query um, which sub-datasets are available 
uh, now in the mod maps sub data set and here I can see oh god there are even more sub data sets uh, in this data set here uh, those sub data sets contain data that is used for testing and validating uh, software performance and at this point you really might sick uh, of seeing sub data sets uh, because what's the point I guess <laughs> um, well, what is very useful uh, is that subdatasets modularize my paper project. And keeping things modular can make project components more reusable and the overall project less cluttered and more understandable. And by nesting the modular components, I can flexibly link everything that I need for a given project while each component preserves all of its history and provenance. Um, for example, the top-level dataset contain code and manuscript for my paper. This is one standalone component that is useful. Another sub-dataset contains the data that I'm running the code from the super dataset on. This data can be used in more than a single paper though, um, so I'm keeping this as a standalone dataset and just link it in a precise version to my code and manuscript. This way I can use the data dataset easily for all kinds of analysis simply by installing it into the dataset that I currently develop my code in. Um, the Ramotnav sub dataset contains the Python package that the paper is about and this on its own is again a nice standalone thing and um, the validation data that the software uses is again also used in uh, several contexts and there's also standalone datasets. Now, um, because all of these datasets are linked as a nested hierarchy of datasets, if I share my paper with you, you can go from the finished paper back to the raw data um, that I base my analyses on and get a complete overview of what I have done should I decide to share all of that. And uh, this uh, aids the reproducibility and transparency of science greatly. Um, I'll elaborate on the principles behind this a bit more later, but let me first show you how, in general, important it is to version data and link precise dataset versions. One of the validation data subdatasets ca um, came from another lab that shared their data. And after I was almost finished with everything and was writing the discussion, I came across a paper that reported a mistake in this shared dataset. I checked. Um, and the mistake was still present in the data that I was using. So um, if you go into the history of this specific sub data set and um, uh, check it out, then uh, you can see that at one point I contributed a fix that changed the data. Um, the data is now fixed, but this um, nevertheless means that there is a difference in the data that existed in 2018 and the data that existed in 2019. And changed data is a very um, a dangerous thing to the reproducibility of science because changed data usually also means changed results. Um, but because everything here was linked as data-led datasets, I was simply able to update the data to its most recent state and then rerun all of my computations automatically, embed all of my results automatically and have um, correct results based on fixed data. And um, if I wanted to, I could even go and check, for example, how robust my results are against mistakes like that by resetting this data set to a previous state and then rerunning everything again. Um, so having data-led um, version data is, um, from my personal experience, a really useful thing to have and a uh, great protection against uh, unknown changes in data that can make data potentially irreproducible if you're not aware that your data changes. Cool. This has hopefully given you a first idea on why nesting datasets is useful, um, why version controlling data is important for the reproducibility of analyses, uh, and how complex but yet surprisingly understandable data that datasets can be combined to publish reproducible research objects. And that already brings us to the next part of this demonstration, reproducible analyses. Not only can I version control data and consume data with data led, 
I can also create datasets uh, with data analyses in a way that my future self and others can easily and automatically repro uh, reproduce and recompute what was done. And in order to do this, I actually don't need to do much. Um, I need to comply to some basic organizational principles for datasets and I need to tell Datalet to record how analyses are conducted. Um, the results of such an effort will be a dataset that has a provenance record on how results of an analysis came into existence. And it also has the ability uh, to automatically uh, re-execute an analysis. And I'm going to show you how this is done. But first, um, let me give you a, a wrap up of these basic organizational principles I um, talked about. Um, if you're interested in the details of them, then you can read up on them in the Datalet Handbook in the chapter on Yoda principles. Um, you will also recognize them from the setup of the reproducible paper repository that I have just shown you. So, first of all, you should make sure that your dataset is clean and modular. Um, the analysis code should be developed in the top level dataset and the input data for the analysis um, should be installed in its precise version as a subdata set, for example. So you have the code component and you have the input component separate, uh, yet linked as um, data sets. Um, next, you shouldn't touch the raw data. When you compute results for a data analysis, don't save them into the input data set. Um, instead, keep the subdataset clean and untouched and collect the outputs in the top-level dataset. This makes it easier to understand your directory structure. So um, if you include outputs and inputs into the same directory, it will be hard for others in your future self to uh, understand which is input, which is output. But importantly, um, adding the outputs to the dataset that you computed your um, or developed your code in and ran your code in will also help you to link um, your results to the code and the computation. Further, uh, keep super datasets self-contained. Uh, write scripts that reference subdatasets or files with relative paths instead of absolute paths. This way you can share your dataset um, and uh, the scripts will run successfully um, on other computers that have a different underlying file structure if they only reference uh, files or subdata sets as relative paths. And finally, you should record as much provenance as you can. So you should link datasets by installing them as subdata sets. You should record the execution of commands to track which scripts produced which output, or even attach a software environment to the execution rec record. And if you adhere to these principles, then you can create data analyses that can be um, automatically and even computationally uh, reproducible. I'll show you the basics of this in a small data analysis project in which I will run a simple classification analysis on some data set. Uh, this is a toy example and it's simplified to make my life easy and uh, to not have you bother um, with understanding the computation, but the principles that I'm showing you can be applied to a data set, uh, to a data analysis of any complexity. So here, what I'm doing, um, I'll take this very uh, known iris data set and run a simple k-nearest neighbors classification on it. Um, importantly, in this analysis, uh, I will make sure that I not only record how I uh, run the computation, but um, I will also make the computation automatically reproducible. But first, um, let me set up my analysis. Uh, for this, I create a new dataset. Here, I use a different configuration procedure um, that is called uh, Yoda. Um, this configuration um, sets up a helpful structure for my dataset with a code directory, and some readme files, and it applies helpful configurations. Next, I will proceed by installing my input data as a subdataset to keep everything nice and modular. 
Um, for this, I created a dataset with a CSV file that contains the iris data, and I published it to GitHub. Here, um, I'm installing it into a directory that I call input. The last thing I need is code to run on the data and produce results. For this, uh, I have posted a, a k-nearest neighbors classification uh, analysis script that I'm currently printing to the screen and then save into a script.py file in my code directory. Um, this script is written in Python and it uses the package pandas uh, to, load the iris the, to load the iris data, the package seaborn to plot the data and then save a figure as a result, and the package sklan to perform a k-nearest neighbor classification and save those results. Um, I have also, as you can see, included a datalet get command in this script, just for you to see how datalet can be used in Python scripts. Um, and what you should uh, note here is that all of the paths that I'm using in this script uh, are relative and not absolute. So they only point into, for example, the uh, subdata set or to the root of the super data set. I have um, copied the script into the code directory and running data net status tells me that it is uh, unsurprisingly untracked. So let me quickly save it to the history of the dataset with a data let save command. Uh, we can also uh, pretend that this script is really complex and I have spent weeks working on it with plenty of data let saves in between. Um, and uh, if I want to, I can also identify uh, this finished state of my analysis script with a um, tag, an identifier. I can attach this with the dash dash version tag option of the data let save command. Now with um, my input data um, installed and with my uh, code script uh, set up, I can in principle now run Python, so interpreter um, code script.py um, to execute the script and produce results. Um, but if this script or this analysis uh, would be more complex or an analysis of one of many, then it will be bloody difficult to associate the outputs with the script that was run or with the data that it was run on after, let's say, two days. Um, it's very hard to remember such things. And uh, the challenge that DataLed helps me to accomplish is uh, to run this script in a way that links the script to the results it produces and also to the data that it was computed from. I can do this with a specific command that is called data led run. Um, I'll visualize it here um, and I'll walk you through the uh, figure in a bit. Um, data led run, in principle, is a command that uh, captures the execution of any command, the execution of a script, the execution of a terminal command, um, and then links the command that was run to the output that was produced. So it takes the dataset state um, before running the command, then runs the command, checks what changed in the dataset, and saves all of that, linking it to the command that was run. So if I'm running a script, I can link the outputs that are produced by this script uh, to the script uh, and the command I called it with. In principle, this is really simple. <laughs> so let's uh, start. Um, first of all, we need to have a clean data set. Um, afterwards, I'll compose my data let run command. I give the command that I would execute, in this case, python uh, code script.py to datalet run. Um, and datalet will take this command, run it, and save all of the changes in the dataset that this leads to under the commit message that I have specified with the dash m option right at the start of this command. Um, so this already associates the script with um, the results that will be produced from it but the command can even be more helpful. It can also um, help to retrieve the data that is necessary. So I can specify the input data in the command and datalet will get the data beforehand. 
because even though I have installed this sub data set, I haven't retrieved the data that is inside of it. Um, here in this uh, particular command, I also specify the output of the command. In principle, this is uh, not always necessary. And to understand fully what this does, please read chapters two and three of the data led handbook. Um, but in general, uh, specifying these outputs will allow me in a couple of minutes to um, uh, rerun the command and let me update outdated um, results. Now, if I run this, uh, datalet creates a commit in my history. This commit has uh, the commit message that I gave to this commit as a uh, human readable summary of what was done, uh, but this commit also contains um, the produced output, so it's already linked. Um, and importantly, the commit has a machine readable record that contains information on the input data, the results, and the command that was run to create this result. Uh, this machine readable record is particularly helpful. So it's not the most readable thing, but it's not meant for human consumption, it's meant for uh, machine consumption. Because now I can instruct um, datalet to rerun this command uh, so that I don't have to memorize what I had done and the people that I share my datasets with don't need to ask me how a particular result was produced. They can simply let datalet tell them. Uh, and re-executing a command that was uh, ran through datalet run uh, is done with the datalet rerun command. Um, for this demonstration, I have prepared an analysis dataset and published it to GitHub, just the same analysis dataset that I have uh, created with you right now. And um, now let me simply clone this repository and uh, then use the datalet rerun command to rerun the uh, run command that I have used. So imagine that I'm a collaborator of myself, I received this data set, I want to find out what was done, and I'm simply rerunning the exact computation. Um, for this, I could uh, use something like a tag, um, but here I'm uh, just uh, checking the checksum of the uh, run commit and put it into the datalet rerun command. Datalet will then read the machine readable record that is attached to this uh, commit identified by this checksum and then recompute the exact same thing because I have specified everything that was necessary, um, the inputs and the outputs. Um, Datalet will be able to retrieve the data and update um, the outputs, for example, should the data change and so forth. And now I have reproduced the results that I computed here. Cool. So this allows others to uh, very easily rerun my computations. Um, but uh, honestly, it also spares me the need to remember how I executed my script. I have scripts that have many command uh, arguments and sometimes I really can't remember how to execute them. And if I execute them with datalet run, I can simply rerun them and have datalet take care of this memory task for me. And that's really helpful. Um, what I uh, could also do now is I could alter my script a bit, for example, change the color scheme of the figure that I have created, and then simply uh, rerun the command again to update the figure um, to a new color scheme. Um, what is also useful in this um, data set is that I can simply ask a result where it came from. And this can be as simple as just running the git lock command on this result. And afterwards, the git history of this command will tell me all of the commits that are associated with it. So with this um, very simple information, I can find out which script produced this result on which data. I can even find out on which uh, version. Um, and who did this and when this was done. Very useful if I ever want to blame someone for a particular computation, for example, myself. Um, cool. But let's now take reproducibility uh, one step further even. Let's say that I share this dataset with you and I want you to recompute my results. 
If you, however, don't use Python regularly and don't have the required Python packages available, running the script and recomputing the results will naturally fail because you don't have the software available. Uh, in order to be computationally reproducible, I also should attach the software that is necessary for a computation to this execution record. And this is particularly helpful if you're using software where um, different versions of it produce slightly changing results, or if it's software that's just um, a pain to download. So if you want to spare others the pain of setting up their uh, software environments just so that they can recompute and validate your results, do them a favor and attach software environments to your computation. And the way I can do this um, is with a Datalad extension. Datalad has several extensions that come with um, special functionality and add Datalad commands to the commands that Datalad Core already has. Um, in this case, the Datalad extension is called Datalad Containers. Uh, you can install any Datalad extension uh, with the Python package manager pip. So in order to install this, in uh, this extension, I can simply run pip install datalad containers. This extension is really helpful because it allows me to attach software containers such as Singularity uh, or Docker containers to my dataset and then it will execute the commands that I'm running inside of these containers. Um, with this, I can not only share my code, my code execution and my data, but also the software that everything runs in. And here's how it works. Um, first, I attach a software container to my dataset using the datalad containers add command. This command takes a name of the container, um, here I call it software, and a URL or a path to where this container can be found with the dash dash URL uh, flag. Um, you can have a container locally and then point with a path to it or, um, as in my case here, point uh, to a URL on Singularity Hub or also Docker Hub. And uh, what this command does is it records the software in the dataset. So you can see that the container is currently being downloaded and then saved into my dataset. Um, afterwards, I can rerun my analysis in the software container using the datalad containers run command. This um, containers run command works just as the run command before. I only need to additionally specify the container name. So um, if you now were to rerun uh, such an analysis uh, that was run with uh, datalad containers run, datalad would not only retrieve the input data, but it would also retrieve the software container and then execute the um, command with the code that you provided on the data that is recorded in uh, the execution inside of this container. And thus, you can make sure that your analysis is as uh, reproducible as you can potentially make it. Cool. So um, to summarize this last demonstration, Datalet contains functionality to create reproducible analyses by linking data, um, code, code execution, and software to the results that it produced. This helps others to understand and recreate your analyses, um, but it will also be helpful for yourself to reproduce your own results and keep track of what you have done. I hope that this demonstration um, gave you some interesting glimpses into the basics of Datalad and what is possible with it. There is a lot that I didn't explain yet and there is much more that you can use Datalad for. All of this is detailed in the Datalad handbook though. So if my demonstration intrigued you and you want to find out more, then go ahead and read the Datalad handbook, check out this, the um, pieces that you need and learn how to do the project that you envision. You can, um, as a start, also, for example, clone publicly available datasets such as the ones from OpenNeuro to just explore datasets a bit more um, and uh, explore the looks and feels of them. If anyone is still listening at this point, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I'll finish with, with acknowledgements and with uh, many thanks to the creators and contributors 
of DataLed and the DataLed Handbook. If you have questions, then reach out, for example, in the DataLed Riot channel or on GitHub of DataLed or of the DataLed Handbook. And if you want to, you can contribute to the development of the DataLed Handbook, for example, with your own use case or by simply making the book more accessible or understandable. I appreciate everyone who reaches out. I hope that I will be able to meet you in person, tell you more about DataLed face-to-face, and in general that we all get safely through this pandemic. Uh, I wish you a happy further train track, and uh, if I'm here in this train track session, then bombard me with questions about DataLed. Bye from my side, and see you in the chat. Hello everyone, For we are at the question and answering session. One of the questions were about the Windows bug, which I couldn't read about, but you answered that, I saw that. Yeah, I posted a workaround, that's a, yeah. bit, that's a bit inconvenient. I'm very Hello, sorry that we ran here at the question and answering. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, very sorry. Very inconvenient that we ran into a Windows bug during a software demonstration. Um, happens on Windows more often than in any other operating system. But there's, so, there, but are, there, there are ways to, to get around this and we've noted it, so we hope that we can fix it. Thanks, Robert. So I'm not seeing any other questions, but if any people just write on the chat, I can read them for you or if you have anything to mention, Ben or you, in addition to your very nice presentation with rabbits, uh, just feel free to add. Maybe I can pitch my open science room uh, demonstration where you can see a little bit more dense data led content. Uh, it's airing on June 24th and uh, there I'm showcasing different things. Um, <coughs> starting uh, slightly uh, less basic, but I'm showing how to install HCP data, run uh, analysis with fMRI prep on the data, and then publish it to a uh, public repository. So if you're interested in that, it also only takes seven minutes to watch. Uh, please join. Perfect. I just reminded Remy to stage because I forgot him, sorry. Uh, meanwhile, how I'll ask that she tried to create a data that, that is it on remote server with 30 subjects. It was really slow, but were fine. Would it be a potential reasons? Yeah, I, I don't have so much details. If she added. Okay. Uh, I have to, to create. Oh, you can you can read the question. So yeah, that would be nice. Uh, I'll give maybe, that to Ben. Maybe I. Yeah, but. Uh, I I if you want to have how on on stage and she again ask the question herself then you can actually chat about it that would be a bit more i'm, I'm just going to vacate my seat and then she will have how okay okay come on stage so the weekend you can have a chat about it okay okay i'm just inviting how you might use it on screen yes it's really handy when someone asks the question i don't need to search for the name but I know how. Okay, invited and waiting for the connection. Hey. hey. Oh, thanks very much. That was a really dumb question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a dumb question. Oh. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you're asking why it potentially could be slow on the remote server, of course there yeah. are a lot of potential reasons, but um, the main thing to look at is the file system. Uh -huh. Because everything that DataLed does uh, itself, and that is not just downloading things or something, uh, is relatively heavy on the, on the file system or can be. And if you have, say, an uh, NFS mount or something, that can slow down things considerably, and there's nothing we can do about it. It's just that the file system operations um, take a long time. So that really depends on the on the setup you're you're running there. Yeah. So there is no immediate solution if I want to say put data on the university HCP 
and yeah. Yeah, no, not not without looking at uh, what what's the exact setup uh, on your server. Yeah, um, that's that's a bit complicated, and I understand that. <laughs> yeah. At, at least, at least on, on an occasion like this, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. if it works fine on your laptop, then uh, should be clear that in general yeah, it works, uh, and everything else is depends. As I said, uh, <laughs> NFS mounts or a Samba server in between or whatever it is um, might be a big burden for performance. Yeah, I might talk to the sysadmin about that, but. It's not going to be successful most of the time, but I'll try. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for the question. I can keep reminding the people who are asking questions. It felt more interactive for me. I don't know if you want that. Yeah, it's nice. I just invited. It's a really nice question for me because I'm working on big data so i need to learn the ways of scaling things up waiting for the invitation to come no it rejected okay okay we just answered that ah can data okay. scale beyond 500 gigabytes yeah. uh so the largest uh data set we're currently version controlling is the human connect home project those are 80 terabytes um, the uh, important piece of information to keep in mind is that this is not in a single data set because uh, where we do not run into scaling issues with the file size uh, or the amount of, of data in terms of gigabytes being version controlled, Git Annex can do all of that really well. The amount of files is a problem that Git runs into. So if you have 100,000 uh, 200,000 files, then this can uh, become a problem. But what you can do with DataLed because of the nesting capabilities is to just create plenty of data sets and nest them in each other. So for the Human Connect Home project, there is one super data set and then uh, about 5,000 uh, sub data sets, which um, gives us a manageable amount of files in each sub data set. And yet all of the data sets are linked. And if you go um, to the super data set, you can clone it as one thing and then install all of the sub data sets, for example. And the next large project that we're tackling is the UK Biobank. And I'll keep you updated in the data handbook on how that goes. Wow. Sounds really exciting. And if there are no other questions, I am just finishing and going on the wrap, wrap up session. If you don't have anything to add, or if you have, please do. I don't know, in chat, I, I noticed some questions, but I think it's... I think Leonard already answered that question. OK. Then, so thanks again, Leonard. Uh, yeah. And thanks so much for everyone's attention. Thank really you. Fun. Thank you. It's been really fun. Now I'm ending. It's been really great to see you. Oh, another question. Yep. About nesting. I have an independent sub data set as input, then I have a code operates on this data set and creates output that can become an independent data data set. I'm not sure what I'm reading. Sorry. I'm also not super sure. Then again, I could um I Yes. Uh, you okay. Yeah. So uh, if I get that right, um, that question is about uh, how to link data set to each other in terms of sub data sets. And uh, you suggest that you have the output folder be just another uh, sub data set. Of course, technically you can do that. We would not recommend that. Um, that is against what uh, Adina mentioned are the Yoda principles. And the idea is, um, that it is better in terms of reproducibility and how to trace things back that the output knows where it came from and what it refers to. So the input should be a sub data set to the output uh, data set, not the other way around. And if you go with a structure that has, say, an input data set and an output data set and a super data set that binds them together, then you still have uh, a unit to get everything and you have that binding, 
but you you lose the reproducibility because the output um, data set cannot refer to the input data set because the input data set isn't part of it, right? But that is not a technical limit limitation. You can do that. Um, we would just not recommend that. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation and the great answer. So, so far we answered three questions and if the if users and people have some questions, they can reach out to you from Twitter, Metamost, and whichever channel you prefer. Yeah, definitely. Or just create an issue on GitHub. Yay. Yeah, GitHub is the best way. I forgot <laughs> that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Ooh. Hello, everyone. So we're joined by Adina and Yaroslav or Yarek. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to bombard both of them. Yes. Yarek didn't ask for this, but I decided to invite him anyway, because he's going to tell me. Oh, he volunteered. OK, good. Perfect. Now I feel even less bad. <laughs> also, there's so much. Wait, are you in, uh, uh, oh my god, Hanover? Is that where you are, Yarek? In Vermont, across the river. So I'm in Norwich. I'm Norwegian. Wow. There's so much nature. It looks beautiful. There's a question. Is data led like a superset using which I can version control both my data and my code so I can do everything that Git can do and much more? Or is there something that Git can do and data led cannot? That's a wonderful question. You can do everything in a data led data set that Git can do. Every Git command works out of the box. So you can do branches, uh, you can do everything that you usually do with Git history if you do stuff like that, plus much more. Cool. Any other questions? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good guy, huh? We are getting there. Uh, you can post the there's an ask a question feature at the very bottom. Michael is in bed, Samir. Uh. <laughs> yeah, or if you ask there in the chat, then if you put a if you put the the uh, question mark, then it will ask you if you want to make it a question. <laughs> so just say yes. Yeah. So pretty much following up on that question from Chris, um, work tree. Uh, those who are familiar with Git work tree concept, which is great, we're working with different branches within the same repository. That one is yet to come into the clip, but uh, I believe there is no fundamental problems. I believe some of them were resolved on Git Annex level already, so just a matter of, oh, and Michael is here. Oh. Um, well, we can only have four people, but if Mike, oh, okay, I guess Michael is in bed, so I don't know if he would want to join. <laughs> I can disconnect if you want. Um, Michael, do you want to join? Yay or nay? It's in the middle of the night here in Germany. Uh, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna guess the answer is no. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. Okay, he said no. <laughs> um, so any other? I mean, Samir asked if we like Michael more than we like Yarek. Samir is not answering always. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael did. Oh, there's another question. Uh, that is very interesting about tracking which code produced an output. Unfortunately, I still don't get how to do it and how it works. Um, luckily, I can just point you to a wonderful resource where you can find out about all of this. Um, section or uh, uh, chapter two of the data led handbook is a complete walkthrough through data led run and i think it's chapter eight or nine where containers run is introduced with a concrete example and if anything is still unclear afterwards then that's a deficiency of the handbook and i would really appreciate if you could create an issue uh, about what is yet unclear and then we can fix that cool um i know a really easy way to make adina blush and that's to compliment her on the data <laughs> okay. it's actually so good though i mean when i was using it to run um like a data log boutique tutorial with greg 
I was reading it and I'm like, it's so entertaining. It's just, it's so good. Very well <laughs> written. Thank you. <laughs> um, I can uh, maybe use this opportunity to, um, for anyone interested in more data led workflows, pitch the Open Science Room demonstration on data led. So, those were the absolute basics that I uh, had plenty of time to lay out in this uh, train track session. Uh, but there is a seven minute concise and really dense demonstration on June 24th in the Open Science Room. You can register for this even if you are not attending the OHPM, um, where I show how to obtain human connectome project data with data led, uh, run fMRI prep in a containerized environment and then publish all of the results to a repository hosting service, including the data. So if you're interested in that, then um, check out this demonstration as well. Awesome. Cool. I mean, uh, this chat is just super active right now. Apparently, um, <laughs> Adina wins. <laughs> There's another question. Uh, what do you mean by container uh, when you mentioned that during the presentation? Um, a software container. So uh, I specifically used a singularity container. This is one containerized solution. Maybe you have also heard of Docker as another containerized solution. Um, put simple, a container is just a bunch of software that is put into a file that allows you to encapsulate a complete software environment. Um, there is a train track session on uh, containers and I think that uh, train track session is spe spectacular, also with lots of hands-on um, tasks. So I would uh, advise to to join that one. Uh, I think Stefan uh, does it. It's it's really good. Yeah, it's happening tomorrow. So um, I don't remember exactly what time. I will check right now. I think I posted about it earlier. Yeah. Today, I think. Yeah, it's well nine fifteen for you for New York time, ten fifteen for. Also, well, Texas and Mexico, and I don't know the place. Uh, oh, it's at eleven fifteen a.m. Uh, to twelve thirty p.m. EST. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> any other questions before we go into? Oh, do you use Circle CI, and have you encountered any issues? I give that to Yarek. We use Travis, we use GitHub workflows, we don't use CircleCI. Uh, we encounter issues every day, sometimes in the morning, sometimes at night, sometimes they encounter us. Um, so, like recently I said, if you don't cause some software to break, you don't use it correctly. Uh, I mean that you need to explore you know, the, the bandwidth, and we are trying to do quite a lot of testing. Uh, our test pass through all the tests at the moment takes about an hour. Um, and there is additional tests in other repositories. Can you use Travis for data? Yeah, we use it, let's say, in Hudicon project. We use data led to get sample data sets on which we try conversion. So you just, uh, I recommend to either install it through Anaconda, or if you base your image on Debian or Ubuntu, then you enable near Debian and you get installed data led and then data let install whatever you want, either within Python or in common line. Cool. Um, I'll just make a quick announcement on behalf of Christine Rogers, who is also part of the McGill Center for Integrated Neuroscience. So um, there will be an on-conference tomorrow uh, that's basically just a continuation of the COMP demo from today, and it'll be at 2.30 p.m. EST on Zoom. And I think that um, I think it's the hbm comp channel where the details are posted. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Christine. Um, if there aren't any more questions, maybe we can give people a few minutes, but otherwise we just have a wrap up left for today. Thanks so much for everyone's attention. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. All right, in that case, we will jump into the uh, wrap up. Thank you, Yarek and Dina. Bye.